But as far as my general like ethos of what I'm trying to do is calm people down and wake them up. You know, everyone is so freaked out and frazzled and muddy minded. And a big part of what has found its way into my work is I have a real like, like a fuck yeah type of aspect of my personality as far as you can like all my friends, I've, I've had this conversation with you a million times. Yes, you can do this. Here's what you have to do. You have to basically like define what your goal is, figure out the pathway to do it. You can make it happen. Like let go of that idea that it's some thing out in the distance, you know, figure it out and go out there and like crush it. Welcome back to the transmission, my friends. And I am elated to bring you this one because on this episode, finally, for the first time on YouTube, we have my wonder brother, Corey Allen. He is the returningest guest in the history of Third Eye Drops. We have over 300 episodes that are never gonna be published here on YouTube. By the way, you can go hear the dozens upon dozens with my wonder brother, Corey Allen, wherever you listen to pods. But anyway, why is this the case? Why is Corey Allen back time and time again? For one, he just has diamond-like precision when it comes to communicating spiritual concepts, when it comes to distilling knowledge down to just a pinpoint minimum number of words. He's also incredibly nuanced and tolerant of ideas, yet it's fair to say that his new age bullshit meter is well intact. Corey is the author of the book Now is the Way, which you can procure presently wherever you get your pages. He's also working on his second book, which is as of yet untitled. Of course, Corey is also the host of the longtime running Astral Hustle podcast. Portals for all of that and all things Corey Allen are in the description. And with that, let's just dive in. But first, do tickle the algorithm here on YouTube with a like with a sub, with a comment. It is all immensely helpful if you want to help us uh, increase the circumference of our psychic splash. I would also love to have you in the third eye drops Wonder Lodge on Patreon. It's not only the best way to support the show, you can get involved, participate, join in our patron-only Zoom hangs that feature guests like Corey Allen, Actually, he was our first Wonder Gym guest. We also do other Zoom hangs. I'm doing an AMA soon. We have a patron-only Discord server. You can get physical rewards, all of it and more at patreon.com forward slash third eye drops. So much love to all of the Wonder Dippers already supporting there. And with that, my friends, let's meld minds with the wonderful, whimsical Corey Allen. I don't know of anyone who's as like clear and concise and just drops wisdom bombs in the minimal amount of text or whatever the medium of transmission is like you've it, it's very clear that you're you're working on and very successful at becoming that person. So so I, I appreciate that about you a lot, oh, man. Thanks, man. Yeah, thank you. Received. That, I, I feel like that's got to be something that you are conscious of, because I feel like that's been a topic or or a talking point that has come up multiple times in multiple different ways where you just have really tried to hone things like take away the bullshit, take away the trappings, take away the flowery language in a lot of cases, which is something that I'm personally addicted to. But <laughs> you, you, but it's like... <laughs> Cause like, cause I was, I was looking at your Instagram earlier and it's like on its face, a lot of it looks very basic, but when you get to the heart of like how much truth there is, it's always like a very clear nugget of truth. Yeah. When, yeah so that's I, go, go ahead. I was going to say, yes, that's very intentional. Was that, was there a turning point for that? Or was, is that something you've sort of always tried to do? There was a, a turning point in it, um, very much so. Like, it was what I was trying to do from the beginning as far as, like, communicating. Uh, an intention of mine has always been to be as, like, 
articulate as possible to really get to and describe the idea because um, generally what I'm working with is abstract ideas. Not, not so much now, but in the beginning, I was really working with a lot of that. And so I tried to articulate those things in a lot of detail so that they could be understood, you know? And as that kind of started growing and I started honing in really what it was that I was talking about, because at the beginning of any endeavor, like if you're going to start a podcast, you're going to be a writer or whatever, you think you know what it is that your show is about or your book is about or that you are about as like a public figure sharing information. Yeah. But you really have no idea. You're, you're beginning the journey of discovering what that is. And you just have to go through that process of putting in the reps of doing all the work. And then in that process, observing your mind, like what you're being drawn towards as far as like style and really the content and what is the message and what ideas are you trying to share and why, you know, and I think about and just have watched all those things over the years. And so as, um, you know, I started off being very just abstract, exploratory, casual, sort of almost kind of psychedelic, like brain oh, yeah. droppings, you know? Totally. And um, I always wanted what I offered to be very functional. I didn't want to just talk just to talk or to just kind of like wonder about ideas. I wanted to like, how can we make this shit useful as opposed to just sitting around like, you know, going in circles essentially. Yeah, absolutely, and, dude. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And so basically, as I, I started honing that in, I started cutting it down and getting tighter and tighter with with how I talked, um, how I wrote. And there was a nice point to where I reduced it to a level of simplicity to where it was too simple. And that was really, you could display in like some of my early Instagram stuff to where it was like so simple that um, it like it didn't offer a lot. It was like, here's an idea with no beginning or end. And so if you'd like, you can take that and sit with it and think about it. And if something good comes of it, if you come up with an idea or something on your own, then fine. And honestly, I was in that space because I hadn't felt comfortable, like just recognizing within myself the fact that yes i'm trying to teach people things like i didn't like I f it felt um almost uh insulting or something to be like okay i'm going to like here's my idea like i just never wanted to be this like lofty yeah. guy like telling someone what to think or what an idea was I'm like here's a piece of an idea and if you'd like to think about it for a few weeks you might come to some insights and I just realized that that was really, a, and my stuff wasn't getting as much traction as I wanted. And so I was like, okay, this is a me problem. This isn't a reader or a podcast listener problem. Yeah, yeah. And so I I looked at it and I started saying, okay, let's let's start adding some some functionality and a bit of context to these ideas. And so I started doing that. And then as I started doing that and writing more, I noticed that things started growing and it started resonating with people in a different way. And then eventually, you know, as my stuff grew and grew, I then saw, like, I used these tactics that where I would look at all the stuff I wrote, I would sort them like on Instagram by in my insights by what had the most engagement, what had the most comments, like what got the most follows, what was it that people were really responding to? Because it's like being a stand up comedian. It's like you get instant feedback. You know, same thing with a podcast. You can see how many people listen Like with an Instagram post. You can see how many people like it. You know what's working. And you have to be humble enough to realize that that's what the truth is. Yeah. Like, it's not whatever. You're, you're like, no, no, people didn't get that one. It's like, no, no, you didn't explain that one well enough. That's what the truth is. If a post doesn't do well, but you think it's the shit. It's like, no, you didn't do your, your job good, you know? Yeah. And I mean, there and, are there. Yeah, there are algorithms and things for sure, where it's like you might post the same thing at different times and you're going to get a totally different response. But for the most part, man, you're speaking the most pointed truth about the creative process in whatever medium like it, it is an absolutely humbling process. And part of that process is the recognition of the flaws in 
your prima materia as a mm-hmm. creator. Like, you know, that that alchemical term of like what you come to the table with to transform. Like you think you you have something raw, you have something unhoned, you have something filled with all of these flaws, and there's great potential within that thing, but you only get to the glistening potential by destroying and purifying and sublimating that raw material into something that actually is treasure. And like we all think our treasure when we come to the table is like something special, but the creative process, man, will will punish will punish you if you if you're too high on your prima materia and you think what you're coming to the table with is is really great. And I think I think you can if you're honest with yourself, I think is what you're pointing to is you can do that work yourself. If you can just be open enough, reflective enough, mindful enough to look at your own material and improve it. But that's like a really difficult thing to do. Like that practice of looking at what you've made and be able to achieve an almost outside type of perspective on what you're making. Like to an extent, I don't, I think there's a point where it's not possible. Like you need other pairs of eyes, but I think you can get better at it. And I feel like I've seen you like really mindfully iterate and get better and better and better over time in a way Mm. that a lot of people don't, man. Like, I mean, I think back on a lot of the people that we were friends with when we first started doing this and we first started making podcasts and whatever. And a lot of them aren't around or a lot of them didn't, didn't stick to it or they didn't evolve or they, or, or whatever it is. And you're one of those people who's definitely metamorphosized. You're definitely one of those people who has moved stages through the proverbial alchemical process of creativity, I think. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I, I'm glad you see it. I, I definitely have uh, experienced that from the inside outward. And yeah, I mean, you know, I think that it's easy to, you're talking about creativity and kind of monitoring and being realistic with your own work. I think that like, there's just various phases that you have to pass through. And I think one of those is sort of, as I said, there's a long gestation period of like figuring out who you are, what it is that you're really trying to do, you know, what it is that you're good at and what it is that you're trying to do often don't necessarily talk to each other. That's a good point. So you kind of have to figure out like, okay, well, if I'm really good at this and people really like this, like, how can I leverage that with what it is that like I would prefer to be doing more of, you know, there's a lot of different things like that. Um, but I, I really look at the whole thing. I, I zoom all the way out and look at the whole thing. It's all part of the creative process. Right. And so I approach the creative process with real realism and curiosity. And to me, it's just in terms of writing, like, as I continue to hone in and track like what's working in my writing, what's connecting, it, how I'm articulating ideas and all that, um, to me, I'm just curious about that because, you know, the 20 year old me would have arrogantly and idiotically gone like, no, I'm not changing anything because this is my art. And, you know, it, it, it's good. And it's like that, that's the voice of someone that doesn't understand art. That's pure, just kind of beginner's bluster. Beginnersbluster.com. That's my new, <laughs> that's my coaching website. Um, that's just in your, know, it's about, because look outside of yourself, like transmute not only your creativity, but you're thinking on your own creativity, like yeah. how your creativity can live in the world and all that stuff. I mean, that's all part of it. And that's also how you will get your work to really bloom into what you want it to is by following those steps and by seeing like it needs to change as you change, you know, your work needs to change. Your work needs to like meet certain goals and like fulfill certain purposes. And it's just about getting really realistic about what that is. And then not getting all caught up in your, you know, ego kind of head game about being inflexible with what it is, because like, for example, like me kind of slowly changing my writing style over the years, obviously it's far more successful now than it was five years ago, but someone could look at that and go like, oh, well, you know, you change your style. Like that's not being authentic. It's like, no, I'm actually writing now what I was trying to write then. Mm. 
I just yeah, had and, to kind of grow up and and shift and let it happen. Yeah, and I think I think there is a beauty to like a raw expression that's unconditioned and that you're just doing for yourself, but then people get their wires crossed in their mind when well, I've I've given my true attempt at raw expression. It has not exploded in the zeitgeist and been purchased by thousands of people. Like yeah. th that's where you got to be honest with yourself because if you're trying to just do raw expression great i don't think i think that's amazing but then you got to be honest about like trying to like if you're trying to make that into a product or a living or get other people to like it on social media or something we we get our wires crossed and we we like that can reflect poorly on our ego or make us anxious or feel like what we're doing isn't quote unquote good or something like that and that's one of the weird things like i there's this weird conflation now between creativity for the sake of creativity and art for the sake of art and essentially products like creative products because really anything you're putting out there with the intention of getting people to like or purchase it's like now a creative product Absolutely. so it's like there, there's yeah. like this weird conflation now where it's not good. It's not good if it's not a if it's not a successful creative product. And I think that gets us into a weird place about what creativity is really for and how it's functioning practically in the world. Because it's like, you know, there's there's definitely a Venn diagram of good art and success, but then there's also success that's objectively i think most critic critics would say or most people would say is 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 not good or is trashy or is you know mass produced or whatever and writing like pre I, premeditated i think is the, the yeah the grossest aspect of it is mcdonald's the best restaurant you know right, it's like exactly. or it's, it's like taylor swift is like yeah. is she the best song it's like well like her and beyonce have 100 producers per song you know what yeah. i mean <laughs> So how do you how do you ride that line personally between like authenticity and what you know will will sell or get likes or get clicks or and how do you like balance those forces in your mind? Yeah, I mean I, everything I'm doing is authentic. Like that's my rule of thumb. Like I have some people like other authors I'll talk with sometimes and they'll hit me with posts and be like, "Hey, should I post this?" You know, and they'll be like, "It kind of like sort of feels good but i'm a little unsure i'm like then don't post it like just write something else like it's always a yes like if it's not intuitively a yes like this feels right and this feels true then i don't even question it like i just chunk it out and now fortunately you know my writing has got to a place where you know you know 95 percent of the time just what i write i am writing from that place and so unless it just kind of comes out wrong or i'm in a weird headspace or something, then generally it's kind of what I feel because I write from where I'm feeling. Right. So, um, I don't make any sacrifices as far as like, I don't do anything for clicks or for engagement or anything like that, um, by any means. So I don't really battle with that. I think that my battle was understanding, you know, several years ago, like what it meant to evolve your work mm -hmm. and the, and what it meant to understand and define the stakes and the outcomes that you desire and really being honest with yourself about what you want, you know, because for a long time, I'd be like, well, you know, I, I want to kind of write stuff and have podcasts and like, it'd be, you know, it's great to make a living off of it. And that, you know, and I don't have to be, you know, super visible, like as long as I can do my thing. And that's true. But then as I just meditated on that more and more, I was like, I mean, that's partially true, but the real truth, the truth underneath that is, of course, I want to be super successful. Like everyone wants to be a mm -hmm. pillar of whatever industry they're, they're in. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's like just being honest with yourself of like, oh, yeah, like I want to be a best-selling author. Like who doesn't that's trying to – if you don't want to, then some might suggest that you shouldn't be doing the thing to begin with because it means that you're not aiming for the stratosphere. It's like, even if you're doing something just for the sake of art, you should want to be the best person doing the thing just for the sake of art. 
because inherently what that means is it's not about, you know, hypothetically, it's not about ego. It's about being the most impactful and creating the strongest work, you know? And so I think that kind of being honest with myself and also, you know, understanding <clears throat> like how my writing and how my work needed to shift to do what I want just all really happened naturally. But I had to define all of that and sort of do some honest thinking around like what my goals are, what my intentions are. And what's great is because I lead from a honest place with everything I create, whenever I changed my, was more realistic and about my, with myself, more honest with myself about what I was trying to do, then it was still authentic. It was just being communicated in a different way, you know? And of course, like, the other funny thing about it is that like um that it's easy to not really go for it and like stay get real focused stay hungry really put in the work you need to get to the place that you want because it's easier to not do that it's easier yeah. to just sort of do just enough to get by and then you can relieve your guilt by coming up with whatever passive excuse that you want. It's like, oh, well, it's hard to crack into an industry. It's like, yeah, of course it is. Like, so what's what's your next strategy? Like, what are you yeah. going to do next? You know, you're just going to sit around thinking, like, just, you know, not trying that hard and then feeling sorry for yourself because it's hard to be successful. Like, th that doesn't make any sense. Like, really, you have to really put the work in there and go God, so I'm like this is an inspirational talk you have to really but it's true you have to really like grind it out and like get in there um and you know realize your dream if that's what you want yeah well it is it is refreshing to hear people be honest about like yeah I do want a good outcome I do want to be successful I do want to if I'm an author I want to be a best-selling author because a lot of people will not admit that a lot mm -hmm. of people will pretend that the is long like I just want the thing that I'm creating to be the best version of itself and to have full integrity. And beyond <laughs> that, I don't care. And and I'm there is part of me that is married to that way of thinking in, in the same kind of way that I was talking about before. Like success for the sake of success does not make something good to me, but also you want like you want to be respected and successful enough that it shows that what you are doing it, it's weird man because i don't think for something to be creatively successful it needs to win over the masses but at the same time that the right amount of that like winning people over can't be zero like there there is there is some level of success that's required. And I don't know how to balance those things fully in my mind. Because like, we, we've had many conversations in the past about like looking at the people we, were, we attract and being relieved. You know, like being relieved, like, oh man, I'm so glad these are my Patreon patrons and they're not a bunch of just like, just people that I can't, I'm, there's like words I'm not going to use right now, but pe people that I can't stand so there's like a there's like a weird mixture of like you want to attract like-minded quality human beings through your creative acts and build a, a group of people that you feel like you're kind of doing something with, right? Like like that you feel like your work isn't just successful but it's contributing to something that matters in the lives of the people who consume it. Because if you're if you're achieving success through some kind of like weird disposable throwaway media that's not really doing anything good in the world, like you're you're in violation of basically every sacred way of approaching life, you know, including Buddhism, right? Like you're you're not doing good works in the world if you're massively successful through making disposable media or disposable physical goods, right? So it's yeah. like you need to be somehow furthering something right like do, totally do, yeah do, what what do you what have you conceived of is is there like a core ethos that you've really conceptualized or is it just is it a bit more abstract than that 
No, it's, I mean, it's pretty clear to me, but I was going to say about success, like, and I think that like creativity is the last place. If you, all you want is to be successful, it's the last place you should try and perform that act. Good point. Because it's not the right place. Like there's a reason Jay-Z doesn't do music anymore, really. Like it's because it's not the best way to be successful and make money. Like there's a lot of other, he's just a business person now. And it's like, if you just want to be successful, like go work on, be like a hedge fund person, like a trader or something like that. Go down the finance route. Like that's, if that's what you're after. Like creative, creativity is a bad place to try and do that if that's all you're interested in. Um, but as far as my general like ethos of what I'm trying to do is, I mean, the simplified version is calm people down and wake them up. You know, everyone is so freaked out and frazzled and muddy minded. And a big part of what has found its way into my work, and especially in the last year or so, um, is this big part of my personality that I, you, I'm sure people see, but I've never really intentionally made it a part of what I'm doing, but I've began doing that in the last year. And that's like, <clears throat> I mean, you, you know, you know me, we've talked countless hours over the years and a huge part of me is I have a real, like, like a fuck yeah, like type of aspect of my personality as far as like, you can, like all my friends, I've, I've had this conversation with you a million times. I, I, you know, think of how many times I've been like, yes, you can do this. Here's what you have to do. You have to basically like define what your goal is, figure out the pathway to do it. You can make it happen. Like let go of that idea that it's some thing out in the distance, you know, figure it out and go out there and like crush it. Like that's a, I kind of like give my friends pep talks and try to get them pumped up because I'm so pumped up about like doing things. And I get so, so energized doing this type of work. And I try and really give that to people as well, because I, I know people are unsure of themselves whenever they have no reason to be. And it's like the difference that in someone's effectiveness, whenever their mindset shifts from someone who is being timid about their own talents to someone who is confident and has self-belief mm -hmm. is like night and day. It just will set someone's whole life on fire in a good way. Yeah. Whenever they start, you know, whenever they make that shift to just believe just believe and have that confidence go out there and do it. And so I really have tried to to work that into my work, you know, in a not in a overt way, but in a way where it's in there and it's clear. Like there's direction of like trying to motivate people to kick them in the ass to like make that switch and to really, you know, not only just read about changes and how to become more self-aware and, you know, grow in the way that you want as a person, but to actually do it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That reminds me of and what's funny is I just brought this up in a, another recent podcast, but there's this thing uh, Trungpa used to talk about. Um, I, I'm pretty sure he talks about it in that On the Warrior's Path Shambhala book. And it's the idea of eventually on on this path of, of mindfulness and on the path of Dharma or waking up or whatever you want to call it, you eventually get to this place of I don't remember the exact terminology he uses, but it's almost like the shining sun mentality as opposed mm -hmm. to this scarce setting sun mentality where you think there's a finite amount of everything and you're constantly worried about yours and, you know, making sure that you're okay. And, and nobody it's, it's, you know, it's like that finite sort of way of looking at the world versus this like infinite, there's enough for everybody mentality. Yeah. And it, he makes it very clear that it's like, if you want to be on this path, you need to be trying to reach this exact state of mind that it sounds like you're you're talking about in a slightly different context where no, there is enough for everybody. And there there and your mind can become this almost engine of plenty and energy for both yourself and other people, like almost like a sun where you are supporting like a solar system of all the people around you, of all the other entities around you. And then you are empowering them to also refract that and be like that. And to me, it does seem like you're, you're becoming that kind of person. And I think that's probably why people are attracted to what you're doing because they sense that energy and they're like, Ooh, this is a good orbit to be in because there's like this, 
there's this light shining through and I want to, I want to drink some of that in. I want, I want that sweet Corey glistening shining wait, wait, through my you prism for, for a 29 99, you know, just I'll say where to send, send the payment. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's cool, man. Thanks. I, I glad, I'm glad that that's apparent. I mean, I think that, you know, it's sort of to put it in outside of like, you know, spirituality terms, there's that saying of like, you know, a, a good entrepreneur creates successful products, but a great entrepreneur creates successful people, mm-hmm. you know? And I think that that's a good way to look at it. It's like, yeah, it's cool to like have small wins, but like, isn't it, wouldn't it be cooler if you teach people how to win, you know? Yeah, for sure. Speaking of, of Trungpa, we've obviously had this conversation many of many times too but i know a lot of the people who influenced you especially when you were younger and who inspired you to go down the sort of eastern mystical introspective path and investigate these different ways of investigating and gaining fluency in your own mind but who who inspires you lately like what what teachers what practices inspire you lately it's a good question. Um, I can't say that I really look to any teachers. I don't read any spirituality books. I don't really consume any spirituality podcast or any content. But you have you have a lot in your life. But it seems like you're mm-hmm. kind of in this place now where you've lo- you've sort of lost interest in that. Is that fair to <laughs> no, say? I mean, um, I haven't lost interest in it. I think I just, um, for now, like I just don't need to drink from the, the river of the Dharma, you know, none of the ideas are really very transformative. Like I just have immersed myself in them for so long. I mean, I mean, you know this, but like for 25 years, I just obsessively studied that type of spirituality and Mm -hmm. like philosophy. And I think I got to a place where I just feel comfortable, you know, as far as this point, like I feel well equipped to go on, continue on my path without needing to look to any type of teacher or anything like that or any type of guide. That's not to say that if I went back and reread one of those books, I wouldn't enjoy it. I certainly would. Um, I just don't seek it anymore in the same way that I used to. And it also doesn't mean that I divorce myself from any of those ideas because I just embody those ideas. You know, I just don't really consume it as content. Yeah. What were early on when you were in that mode of like the searching, the seeking, the consuming information, the trying techniques, what's something that like really sticks out in your mind as a valuable jumping off point? So if people are listening, you know, mo- most people aren't at the point where they've had 25 years of experience of investigating all of these realms. Wh- what's one of your like go-to jumping off points that you, you recall fondly that you would point people toward? Uh, like what type of jumping off point? Probably, well, it could be philosophical, but I was I was thinking more like in the vein of what you have become over time like like what has propelled you in your own maturation um you know particularly with things like mindfulness meditation eastern adjacent ideas i mean i think that just getting in the lab is the most valuable thing you can do i think just repetition and consistency and, you know, my teacher is my own mind. Like, and it always has been. That's like what I kind of where I started. And that's what started the inspiration for all of my personal change and then work now is like whenever I was really young, I just began to notice the changes of my own mind as I started doing, you know, work. And and it's probably that idea was sort of coming naturally, but also at the time I was reading kind of dense uh you know translations of of 
the of dharma and stuff like that and of course buddha talks about watching your own mind and i think that that me at that time of like being a teenager seeing the message watch your own mind and then having such a like a problem with authority <laughs> i was like yeah all right no teachers i'm just gonna watch my mind and eventually i did go through a period of rebelling against the authority of my own mind too it's like Ooh, even a rebel against the, even like questioning my own like the voice in my mind in my instincts as a this is kind of complicated but like if someone is familiar with the of with oh, pure awareness or the capital s self like the observing witness mind the mind that observes your thoughts getting into a place to like even the thoughts that are mine and the instincts that are mine i refuse the the witness refuses to engage with those because they are just transitory mental formations and they will not influence the way that i proceed like as a conscious agent it was a weird so, time <laughs> does that make you i feel like that would make i feel like that would lend itself to like a like a jadedness. Oh yeah, sure. Like, I would, lots of detachment and nihilism. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, and that's what's that's what I always think when you're when when I'm honest about you know, I've gone down the the Eastern mysticism path. I don't know if I would say, you know, extraordinarily deeply, but. You know, I've I've read numerous books. I took courses in college. I've spent a lot of time meditating, and I've also go down, gone down the Western, the Greek, and when I'm honest with myself, I kind of feel like that is partially the point of the Eastern path: is to detach to a level where your own thoughts and the phenomenon in the physical world will no longer make you suffer because you're not attached to them. And if you're not attached to them, you won't be as engaged and you won't be, you won't care as much about the world and the phenomena in the world, but you also won't suffer as much. And it's sort of like an, it's sort of a sacrifice you need to make in order to decrease suffering, which is really the initial proposal of Buddhism, right? Is like, Attachment leads to suffering, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to, to a certain point, detach. But that also, I think, is very unsatisfying to the Western mind because the idea of being detached doesn't sound like a particularly attractive idea. Like, I think, I think we innately are, are sort of trained to be passionate, to try to reach things with all of our passion, right? Like, it, it, we've even kind of talked about that a lot in this mind meld like going after things like with the fuck yeah mentality but how do you also be detached and have the fuck yeah mentality right so th everything you just described is basically where a lot of people get to in the understanding of like eastern wisdom traditions particularly buddhism of course and then that's where they stop and it's because first off even just the languaging of what you're talking about like you use the word detachment a lot but really that's where the main I actually have a part of my new book called don't mistake it's like just a sub little piece but it's mm -hmm. don't mistake detachment for non-attachment very two two very different things detachment is being disconnected and having no you know as you said being kind of numb to thoughts and phenomena and the texture of life and what have you. Non-attachment is simply not trying to grasp those things, but still being present and engaging with them all. And that's a really, I've talked about this on so many podcasts, like I've done solo podcasts about it and brought up a lot because it's a really important point that I never hear anyone talk about. Just like whenever these things graduate into modernity, like everyone's kind of has this real shorthand version of the philosophy and that area you just described leads a lot of people to feeling it's two very negative turns one is it leads to kind of a nihilism or a depressive state another one is that it gives people a like an excuse for being lazy and for not trying 
and and, and being like, well, you know, it, it really just leads to spiritual bypassing because then someone goes, well, you know, the universe will decide whatever, 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 or you know, it does. This doesn't really matter, or I'll accept this, or you know, whatever it is. It's like, yeah, but you're by doing that, you're actually missing the other whole fifty percent of the story, which is engagement. Like you have to be fierce sometimes. Even I, for a while, I was encouraging people to be aggressive with their, you know, with their path because, and not aggressive as in not angry, but like assertive, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just a matter of doing that and engaging in life, being passionate about life, enjoying it, but not clinging to your yeah. idea of how things should be. Instead, just staying right there on the razor's edge of the present moment of like, oh, well, this is what is. Let's get like deep into that and and like work with it while not, you know, becoming disappointed whenever it doesn't follow our imagination. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that is a, a difficult balancing act because when you settle more into that, you know, that witness mind that you were talking about, like that, the perspective behind the perspective of self that sort of watches the watcher, that kind of awareness lends itself to seeing the gestalt a lot more. Like it lends itself to understanding the what I was talking about before, the kind of seasons of, of what everything is, is like, right now I feel like this. And then I know after I feel like that, I'm going to feel like this. And mm. then I'm going to go through this whole cycle again. And because, you know, it's related to the day and my circadian rhythm, and it's related to when I get hungry and it's related, you know, all you, you start like being more mindful of all of these small things. And then it becomes easier to be detached, but also like the Venn diagram again uh, analogy of detachment and non-attachment like there's definitely some overlap there but I think you can you meander too much into that being detached when you get jaded by the gestalt if that makes sense like let me try to explain that a little more clearly for people listening if you if you know the way that feelings tend to go and you, you can be more jaded and less excited and less in the moment of experiencing the thing because you understand that it's temporary and transient. Therefore, you don't enjoy the enjoyable as much, but you also don't suffer the suffering as much. So it's sort of like this place where you can just get lost in this beige sort of POV. So I guess the more practical question is, how do you avoid that? How, how do you stay more in the non-attached versus the detached. Yeah, the the perspective that I that, that landed on me one day to describe that is I was in traffic and I was thinking about this and I was looking at just down the highway there's hundreds and hundreds of cars I could see, you know, the the mile off into the distance. And um I was thinking how interesting it is that a person is driving and they're like, I'm mad that I'm in traffic. It's like, well, but you're also contributing to the traffic. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like you, you, you are traffic to the people behind you, but you're mad that you're in traffic. And if you look at the same structure of that, as far as feeling the kind of detachment or leaning into the oblivious or oblivious kind of nature of witness mind versus the, more um singular focused mind of of like the actor self you can think oh well what's the point whenever you get into that detached state as you said like you know every, there's so many people in the world everything's impermanent it doesn't really matter it's like yeah but for the whole thing to exist that you're looking at for all the people to exist like you have to exist so your role is as crucial as a singular individual, as the role of the whole, like the whole doesn't exist without you. And so just keeping that in mind that like, you are as important as the, the system, because you are the system keeps it to where just a, you can have a perspective of like, yes, I'm one of a lot of various pieces of biological matter on this planet. But I'm a very important one. 
and let's you know get in there and do like play your role like do what you're meant to do in this world you know do you believe people are meant to do something <laughs> meant to like in a fatalistic way I yeah I, I'm, I'm i'm throwing this up because i kind of i generally know your your thoughts on this but i still want to i just want to still want to hear how yeah you play with I, that I just idea. don't really have a perspective on it i don't really have a perspective i don't know I mean, sometimes it feels like it, and sometimes it doesn't. You know. Yeah. It depends on if I've eaten or not. <laughs> <laughs> I know, man. Yeah, people people really underestimate the the fucking influence of hangriness. If I'm hungover, you know? I'll tell you that there's that there's uh, nothing matters, and that it's all just cells and meat. And if I've got some sleep and I had lunch, I'll tell you that. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe we are, you know, following these important paths. <laughs> yeah, Just depends. no, I'm, I'm with you, man. People totally underestimate the importance of neurotransmitters and glucose levels in the bloodstream and all of the things that like put you in a good mood, like dopamine reserves. It's, it's all, yeah, it's all incredibly influential. Like I'm, I'm a total like Nietzschean atheist What's the word I'm looking for? That's enough for me. Pe that works. Pessimist. <laughs> okay. Or, uh -huh. or I'm, yeah, yeah. Or I'm like, no, you, you have a fate. You were brought into the world for a very specific <laughs> yeah. purpose. It's been attached to your soul since the very moment you were conceived. And if you don't try with all of your will to navigate that labyrinth of self, then you are selling yourself short. And I, I do actually think I gravitate more toward that that latter way of viewing life. But I ask you the question because I genuinely have the sense that over time you have kind of drifted away from that sort of deterministic way of thinking. Uh-huh. Could you start that sentence from the top for me? Please? Well, I, I said, I said, I, I asked you that question because I feel like over time you've been drifting more and more from that, ver like, purposeful deterministic way of thinking about life and about individual humans mm. but at the same time like i look at your own life and i look at that hunger that you had to to do something to like rise out of your own circumstances and i have to wonder like where is that coming from if not from sort of some sort of almost teleology almost like design because when yeah, i look no. at you i'm like it's clear like you you're you're even when I met you, you felt like a pretty individuated human in terms of like, oh, I get what this guy is. I get what this guy's doing. I get the path that he's on. And I feel like you're settling more into that. And to me, that does look like individuation. That does look like a kind of destiny and the whole, you know, way that we've talked about many times, like Hillman and the acorn and growing into this thing that only you can grow into. But I also, at the same time, feel like you're you're a bit skeptical of that. I mean, I'm a pretty skeptical fellow in general. Just whenever it's it, it's a useful way to filter out nonsense. You know? Yes, it is. <laughs> um, also, I, over the the last like probably six months, I've, my ears have just kind of perked up to where I've noticed in conversation a handful of people have passively mentioned to me that they like when they're like talking to me about me for some reason and they're like and da 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 da, da and you're cynical and da da da, da. <laughs> i find that really funny i guess it's true um i don't feel cynical you uh, can start wearing brighter colors and people be like oh man you suddenly seem a lot more just like jovial and like they could maybe that's it yeah um no like yeah i i think that Corey always wears year. black shirts for people that don't know him. Yeah, yeah. Just click through all the episodes. You'll see it's the same same fellow. Um, looks like copy and pasted. Um, yeah, like over the years, I, I scrutinized silliness less harshly. And, um, and by silliness, I could mean my own silliness or someone else's. I've just sort of like you know, mumble mouthedly waxing poetic about like any of that stuff. 
you know, and, and it could be some, you know, and like I said, there could be some truth to it. But really, I think over the years, I began to speak more firmly in a deterministic way about it. Because one, I'm like, I find it kind of funny to, to shred the stuff with <laughs> logic. <laughs> like, it's just, it's a funny way to, uh, to deal with it. But like, outside of just me entertaining myself by talking about it in that way. And uh, I mean, I do sometimes say stuff like in a very deadpan way because it's funny to me and I'm not really being serious, but like I'm saying it because it's a funny, a funny way to answer a question and it entertains me in my own mind, you know, but like the, the real truth of it is that like, I just become less interested in things that, um, things that don't really have, uh, uh, an answer, like in terms of like, it's cool to think like, Hey, maybe this is all destined, but I can't really do anything with that. Like it doesn't, I guess the something a person could do is feel like an egoic charge from that with like, all right, I'm on this mission, but I just kind of feel that anyway, you know? Um, and so I really just stuff that I don't really have a perspective on. I just kind of don't think about anymore yeah weirdly i think i've solidly ensconced myself i mean you you already know i'm kind of a serial middle pather when it comes to a lot of things but i can sort of settle certain concepts that seem directly opposed in my mind like the idea of determinism and indeterminism and I, it's i think that for me it always feels like there is something deeply unfinished about being a human, being in the physical realm, and like there, if 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 you were to have a witness mind over the top of the entire phenomenon of humanity, it seems like there are both conscious and unconscious processes that are unfolding. Like there are these huge missions that humanity is collectively obsessed with, and no individual is steering the ship. Yet if you looked at everything going on in a time lapsed way you would say there's a very clear goal that this species is contributing to. Like they're all collectively agreeing on doing these things, spending life energy in this way. And to me, that points to there being some sort of kind of collective unconscious we don't quite understand that is pushing reality and individuals in certain directions. But I think if, and, and the way that I, therefore settle that kind of th those two things that almost sound like they're paradoxical to one another is that I think you can, to the extent that you are able to wake up to your own individual potential and your own coriness, you're able to play a more direct role in what otherwise appears to be an unconscious process to everyone else. And I think actually you can subtract from the process and be kind of baggage that like makes the process less aerodynamic you know mm -hmm. you're, you're you're just kind of like you really can be almost just like a dead weight cellular meat suit if you're not contributing to that collective process and i think where it gets more complicated is like okay so you're saying there's a deterministic process what is the process what are we moving toward and i think that gets a, a lot a little bit more romantic and masturbatory than you would like so i won't go there <laughs> but um but how does that idea hit you, though? Yeah, no, I mean that that makes sense. There definitely, there are definitely two layers at least to an individual human process, which is, as you said, the conscious layer and the subconscious layer. You know, um, for anyone that needs that busted down a little bit, like I like the example of, I think it was, uh, um, oh, I'm trying to remember who uh, Gurdjieff's disciple was wrote the fourth way and all that. Anyway, um, he uh, I'll look at talked that. about like, I think it was him. We'll go with it was him, but this is a guy in a bar telling you this, so <laughs> it could be wrong. I'm just saying like, <laughs> you know, this is a, a vague memory. We're just, we'll just go with it. It's this guy, but that's not important. The important is what's important is the example. Um, he had quit smoking and was sitting around. Ospensky. Ospensky. There we go. Thank you. Um, he was, he'd quit smoking and he was sitting around and he was hanging out and he's like, I'm really hungry for like an apple. You know, I'm going to go to the corner store and grab an apple and he goes in there and buys the apple and then sees 
cigarettes. He's like, well, I'll do one more pack and then I'll, you know, there, there, he never wanted an apple, right? It was like the subconscious mind was like, just drew him into there under the guise of like wanting that. And then right. he's like, oh, look, there happens to be cigarettes at this place that I just walked to. Um, but yeah, there's always a subconscious layer of stuff that's going on and um, in us and, and kind of driving us. And I think that's one of the interesting things about the brain is that it's always getting, trying to get itself to realize things. You know, it's always navigating like under the underwater part of the glacier is navigating the upper part of the glacier into a way so that it can just make these micro connections and like integrate into itself, which is really, really cool. Um, but yeah, if you just zoom that out to a species, then it only makes sense that we're all <clears throat> playing the human game, as it were, on a conscious level. And so it would only kind of, it tracks that as a species, we're playing a, there's a sum total game that we're all playing. that seems to be like self-destruction and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, power dynamics and things like that. Um, and hyper individualism, but also at the same time, you think there's a subconscious, you know, species game, which. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it just struck me when you were saying that I think everybody would agree that sub the subconscious forces of the mind are for sure steering the the conscious mind to an extent that most people are not aware of and collectively we're not aware of, but a lot of people would disagree on what those forces are. You mm -hmm. know, like perhaps they are just as mundane of like what we were talking about earlier, like what's your level of neurotransmitters and blood glucose and right. angriness and all that shit. And then other people like myself would probably go into the realm of archetypes and, you know, Jungian language and probably more mystical language than that even at times. But I think, I think, it, I think where it gets practical though, and we can almost dispense with all of that is that I think you'd probably agree that mindfulness and meditative techniques and introspective techniques are to an extent a way to navigate the part of the glacier that's underwater and become more aware of of what those forces are um but i don't speak for you on that <laughs> damn straight now it, yeah it seems that those things makes the barrier between the conscious and subconscious a little opaque so you can kind of get a clear direction and connection then um and certainly not a crystal clear one but a little bit clearer if you didn't then if you didn't do those things i think i totally agree yeah i mean it's and, i mean even from the most basic like 10 minutes a day of mindfulness type yeah. of practice like the 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 subsiding of the chatter is like level one one. right yeah. yeah but it's huge and, yeah and i think that even through decades of those practices you're still probably only accessing three percent more than someone who does but that's that's really huge that's really that's a useful three percent a lot of high rate of return on that three percent of of subconscious awareness um because there's still just so much that's in my opinion, is unknowable and it's not processable by the front or brain, front I mean, frontal brain. The intellectual mind like can't understand that type of material because it actually doesn't have the inputs and outputs to process in that way. That's why, as a tangent, well, that's a couple of things. One, that's why people that do many too many psychedelics can get annoying. Is because they think that they have a full view of the subconscious, <laughs> you know what I mean? But really, it's just the intellectual brain churning away and creating stories and drawing connections that are there and then having a little sense of pride about being able to do that. Um, well, I think it can be. I mean, do you, do you think that's all it is? I mean, you have a lot of experience in your younger years in that department. But don't you think some of those experiences were valuable and really did teach you. Something oh, hell about yeah. No, no, that's <laughs> absolutely. No, I've said that that's why some people can get some people that do to me. So psychedelics right. can get annoying and don't mean everybody by any means. I just mean, whenever you meet one that you're like, all right, buddy, calm down. 
And then that's what's going on. Yeah. You yeah, get that man, look you, in your eye like you know something. I don't like that because you, because none of us know anything. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, as soon as you're sure that you you know something, you've probably had too close of a brush with some kind of archetypal force in your mind and you've diluted yourself into thinking that you've become special by this brush exactly. with, with yeah. something bigger than your ego. And, and we've all been that guy. And I, I think that life is a good way to to has a good habit of proving to you that you don't have that insight that you thought you did. Yes. I mean, my, my, you know, the feeling of like when you fall down and you have to assess yourself and see if you got hurt, you have like that split second of like, all right, nothing broken. I'm good. Yeah. Okay. I feel like every time after I do have one of those visionary experiences, my version of that is like, did I get prostrated and bent over by the mystery or do I feel like I'm more important now? And if I feel like I'm more important now, I'm like, I got to check that feeling immediately because life yeah. will check it for me in like the next few hours, probably yeah. if I, if I don't do <laughs> it myself, slip on a banana peel in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. Or, or get hangry. I mean, man, this, yeah. this whole, the whole through line of this podcast is, is getting hangry. Um, yes, indeed. But yeah, I feel like that that is a pretty good analogy for like when when you when you tumble down the rabbit hole, if you don't feel humbled regardless of like what you're doing, you probably do need to check yourself. Whether it's mm -hmm. like a meditative rabbit hole, a knowledge rabbit hole, a, a creative rabbit hole, an actual psychedelic rabbit hole, they should probably all be humbling. I think just in general too, but man, if you ever get to that that space that feeling just in the course of life, it's good to stop and ask why. <laughs> Where are you getting your information from? Oh, yeah. You mean just feeling like a sense of inflated ego in general? Yeah. 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 It's good to... I, I would agree. Good to it's go. also fun to feel yourself at sometimes too, though, and and be like, I, I did that shit. I know, I, I know well, you There's nothing wrong like with that. that. I know you're good. like that. No, that's a good thing. You should feel like that. You should feel proud of what you do. When's the last time you felt like that? I feel that way every day. <laughs> That's dope. <laughs> I mean, I do. That's dope. I'm like, it's good to design that, like, do things that challenge yourself every day so you overcome something. I mean, that's like sharpening the sword every day. Stay, Keep your mind sharp. Keep your, you know, spirit sharp, for lack of a better term. Stay focused. You know, like, set a hard task. And it doesn't have to be something that, like, crushes you, but something that you have to overcome you know, that's why I like like navigating those barriers, those like walls of resistance. That's why I like working out in the morning and like pushing myself. That's why I like setting big creative goals where it's like, you know, put in X amount of work, you know, for four hours straight, no breaks, no looking at the phone. And you have to like reach this level of output or whatever, or else you got to keep going. You know, you got to keep going. The clock doesn't matter. It's like, keep going. And it's like, it's like uh, sort of like a tennis player or something where you can get into these little mindsets where you start losing all your energy and you get deflated and you're like, oh, and you're like, and your mind gets foggy and you want like everything in you is telling you to look at your phone, like just take a break and look at the phone and then navigating that little mental drop and building it back up and like pushing through and like then you explode out of one of those and have a great surge of creativity. You know, it's like those things are really really valuable yeah it is man yeah you're firing me up all right to get back to get back i haven't written anything in a lot well other than i mean i'm always writing things for like ideas but not in a structured way like i'm gonna publish something like writing for the sake of writing i've yeah. gone through like weird seasons in my life with writing because that was like probably my primary first form of self-expression and then like going to school for journalism and all this shit like that was a huge part of my life, but I, I always seem to just go in these phases where I'm like writing a lot or not writing at all. And yeah, that might be, it might be in my future, but in my present, I enjoyed this mind meld with you, Corey. Um, obviously you have the pod, you have various transmissions in the digital dimension. Uh, what do you want to share? 
come on over to Hey Corey Allen on all social platforms, Corey-Allen.com, all the goods, the podcast, the Astro Hustle, but I've been thinking about changing the name. So search Corey Allen on your favorite podcast platforms and uh, that's it. And that's where you can find all the stuff. Love you, brother. Go to thirdeyedrops.com. Michael's going to revamp his website to just, it just ports directly over to my website. Yeah, it's just going to be a redirect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 